Holly Furtick Book Club. It is book club night, and I am so excited that we are talking about this book tonight, Hello Beautiful by Anne Napolitano, and Anne is going to be joining us tonight. How much did you love this book? I loved this book. It wasn't a light read, um, but it was a great read, and it was one of those books where you just feel like these are real characters. Like it almost felt like they were real people and you were watching them make real life decisions and you were like, oh, are you sure you want to do that? And kind of watching all the events play out. I love this story so much. I know you did too. Let's talk about this amazing novel called Hello Beautiful and Napolitano is joining us tonight. We're gonna talk to her before we bring her on. Um, let's have a little chat about it. I wanna know your thoughts, like, because last month or last book club, we had Ann Paget on and I got so like excited to talk to Ann that I forgot to talk to you guys about the book. So I'm not forgetting that this time. And I wanna know from you guys how you liked the book, who were your favorite characters? Um, let's see. Let's get right in it. Okay, here are a few things that I, so let me ask you this. Let's just start with, did you have a favorite character? Like the character that you were truly rooting for the most. And I want you to start putting those in the comments and I'm just gonna tell you a few other things that I liked about the book. I love the realness of the characters. I already said that at the beginning. Like I loved how there wasn't really a character that you loved or hated. Um, but it was like watching real people make real decisions. Stephanie Van Alman says, I'm a sucker for a basketball story. Well, if you love basketball, there was so much basketball in this and it made the story. I love, I, I'll tell you something I love. I love learning when I'm reading. And so I learned about a lot about basketball by reading this book. A lot of you guys are saying Sylvie was your favorite. Um, and, uh, books on the runway says William. Okay. So here's a good question that I, I want to ask you, um, if somebody were to say, if you were to say like, oh, you should read, you know, Hello Beautiful, and they were to say, well, what, what's it about? Who would you say that this book is about? That's what I want you to answer next. A lot of you are saying William was your favorite character. Some of you are saying Alice was your favorite character. Alice was great. I loved how tall she was. Um, Lisa says Sylvie really saw people when others didn't. Um, Shell says William was her favorite. Melton, 1960, says William. You guys are all William. Okay, so now I'm asking you who the book is about. Okay, so you all are saying William. I feel, uh, okay, somebody, JMA, is saying Alice and Cecilia is who the book is about. Porcelain is saying the book is about William. All of you are saying the book is about William. If I, yes, thank you, books on the runway. If I was saying to you, you have to read this book, I would not say this book is about William. I would say this book is about a family. This book is about two sisters and one man. This book is about bitterness and forgiveness and family dynamics. Yes, Hefner says it was about families. I just was so surprised when I when I saw um, um, Anne do an interview with Oprah and she automatically started talking about how the book was about William. And I was like, the book's about William? What? I just, I just didn't think the book was, I mean, I loved William. And I now looking back, I realized, oh, he is the character that is like woven through the whole story. So I guess the book really is about William, but I think growing up in a family with two sisters, um, I just really resonated with it being a book about sisters and family dynamics. Sarah Willis says, um, Sarah Willis says, I felt like the fifth sister just watching. That is so great. I totally agree. It's almost like you were the neighbor of those girls and you were sort of like watching everything unfold with their lives. Um, all right. Jamie says she loves how the family saved William. Um, Emily just said, Rose, 
and she did her thumbs down. That's my sister. Hey, Emily. Um, okay. Rose was one of my favorite secondary characters because she was so like, she was so vocal and opinionated. And um, one of my favorite scenes, to me, one of the most memorable scenes in the book. So let's go to memorable scenes. Tell me one of your favorite memorable scenes. Okay, Nana Candy says, I didn't like Rose. Um, so somebody else says Rose was hard to love. There's this scene at the end, at the very end of the book. And, um, you know, uh, sorry, there's spoilers on here. So if you haven't read Hello Beautiful, you might want to get off because we're going to talk about the beginning and the end and all of it in between. So you find out that Sylvie dies, which if you're reading the comments, a lot of people have already told you that they're talking about how she cries. So Sylvie dies. It's very sad. And, um, all the families gathered together and um, one of the sisters says, mom's been gone. Mom's been in Florida for like 20 years and she has something with every sister. Like she's mad at the one sister who had the baby out of wedlock, the other sister who is gay. Um, she's mad at Sylvie for divorcing or Julia for divorcing William and Sylvie for marrying William. And she's just like, just disappointed in general at her daughters and just kind of leaves and leaves them to themselves. So you're kind of mad at her. You're like, geez, mom, like step up. But I, I, I love the scene where I think it's Celia. She says, mom's going to come back and she's going to act like she, nothing ever happened. And, um, I think we should let her. And so they all kind of agree to let her just kind of come back and she comes back and there's this like one little line where it says like she sat down at the at the kitchen table like it was her throne and they all kind of gave it to her like to just be there and be a part of the family as if she wasn't a part of all of the drama and I kind of loved it because it sort of encapsulated the whole family in kind of going like coming to a place in their family where they're like you know what enough like enough of Julia and 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 Sylvie and just enough like we just need to be together no matter what we how we feel because we all have something that we feel and I just love that because it was it just seemed realistic like what family does and um yeah okay anything else that you want to say before we bring I mean we got to bring Anne on this is I can't wait to talk to her about the book. So, okay, let's bring her on. And if you have a question for Anne, as always, keep them going in the comments, keep your hearts and all the things going. I'll try to ask her, you know, all the things that I think you're gonna wanna know. And, um, and but if you have another burning question, put it here and um, I'll try to ask her, okay? All right, let's see. I hope Anne's on here. Oh, Emily, she says she disagrees with me. Um, here she is. Okay. Hi, uh, Anne. Hi. Sorry, that took a second. <laughs> it's okay. There's always little glitches. I was here like, where, where's the button? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you for having me. And thank you for reading the book. Oh, my goodness. Well, like I said, I started with Dear Edward, and I loved it. And I had it on my list for book club for a really long time. And then I saw that you had a new book out. And so I was like, well, let me read that. And I read it as soon as it came out. And I just loved it so much. I loved, we didn't even talk about this yet, but um, I, I loved the sister dynamic. And I loved the little um, homage that it was to little women mm -hmm. and um so take us back, because I want to talk about all of that, but um, take us back to the beginning. So you started with Dear, Dear Edward, well, you didn't start with Dear Edward, but that was kind of like your breakaway book, and you finished Dear Edward. What happens next? Like, how do you know where to go from there, and what sparks are flying at you that are making you eventually come to this? <laughs> Yeah. So when I finish, like, I, so when I finish a book, like when I finished Dear Edward, I get so sad because I live inside the world that I'm writing. And it, by the time I finished a book, it's like a completely fully realized 
to me real yeah. world with like real pe real people in it and then when i hand it over to like the copy editors at the publishing house it's not in my computer anymore and no one's read it yet um so it feels like it just sort of goes away mm -hmm. and i'm very sad until i get a new idea so i just sit there being like please 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 <laughs> and it usually takes about two months uh as i've found um and so what happened was I had an obsession with the history of basketball that had been percolating in me for a while, even though it makes no sense. I grew up playing soccer and I'm married to an English man who plays soccer. And, um, but I could not read enough nonfiction books about basket, the history of basketball. And so you I had no from, brothers that played basketball. You didn't No. Did you grow up watching the NBA or no, no, no. You just all of a sudden you're like, let me read about basketball. Well, what happened was I actually was reading about the the social social justice history of this country. Like I went through a period of reading a lot of books about social about the civil rights movement and that, that sort of history. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I stumbled into the fact that really the history of uh, basketball in this country really uh, runs in parallel and overlaps with the civil oh. rights movement. Okay. And there's significant players like Bill Russell and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar that were involved in this, the civil rights movement. And something about it just really fascinated me. And I could, like, I just read so many nonfiction books about it. And I had this idea of this sad, lonely little boy dribbling a basketball, basically, to start the book. Um, and my process is that once I have the idea, for nine months, I'm not allowed to write anything because what I really like to do is write what I call pretty sentences. And that's like writing a scene and then a character comes in and says something that I didn't expect them to say. And it's like being a reader, it's an act of discovery. Okay. But I, but I can't think like cerebrally or analytically at all when I'm writing like that. So by, by having nine months in the beginning where I'm not allowed to write, but I can think, research and take notes and have ideas and write them down and take a lot of notes, um it allows me to sort of use that part of my brain before i start writing the pretty sentences so nine, and so nine months is just your rule yeah but yes yes <laughs> the, my second novel that i published prior to dear edward took me eight years to write and at the end of it i wrote like 400 pages that i cut and it, it was like there's a wonderful quote from el doctorow the writer about writing a novel and he says that writing a novel is like driving home on a foggy night you can only see as far as the end of your headlights beam, but that's enough to get you oh. home. You see a little bit and then uh -huh. a little bit and a little bit. And I, I do find that to be true. But for my second novel, it was like I drove in figure eights around the country before <laughs> I found my driveway. <laughs> and at, at the end, my husband was like, I think you should do it differently for the next one. Like, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I think there's probably a better way to do it. And so he was like, I think you should take, it was his idea um he said a year and i was like i cannot do a year uh, so i whittled it down to nine months um, wow okay so for yeah. nine months you're dreaming up the characters you're yeah. researching about basketball or chicago yeah. or so where so in those nine months you decide who are the main characters mm -hmm. you kind of get their vision where, and, and is that where you decided where you wanted the novel to take place? Yeah, that was one of the things that I knew quite early. Um, my mother is from a large Irish Catholic family, and all of her brothers and sisters lived around us in New Jersey, except for one brother who moved to Chicago. So he would live there my whole life. And when I was a little girl, he used to send me uh, postcards from Chicago with like the Chicago skyline on them. And it was always addressed to Hello Beautiful. And I, I knew he didn't really know what I looked like because he had like 20 million nieces and nephews and he didn't see me very often. So I felt like he saw that I was beautiful on the inside. Wow. And it it made me feel really, obviously, warm and special. And he lived in the neighborhood of Pilsen, still does, in Chicago. Okay. Okay. And so th that also became this sort of like magical, quasi-fictional land to me. And um, it just felt right to set the novel there. I think I always was going to set something there. Were you always going to name it Hello Beautiful? No, I figured that out like a year in because I was like, I, it initially I was like, this is where I'm setting it because of my uncle Ed. Um, and then I realized, well, that, you know what, that's what Charlie would say to his girls, like he would greet them with Hello Beautiful. And by him greeting him, greeting them that way, I think he saw their specific individual beauty and he pulled it to the surface with that greeting. So by mm -hmm. the time he, by the time he was gone, 
they have a real strength. All four of those women make a bold choice at some point in the book, each of them. Yeah. And I, th I think they have the strength to do so because of the love their father gave them and that they really knew themselves because he saw them um, on the way there. So th that was so about a year in, I realized that that actually should be the title as well. Okay. So you get your characters, you get your setting you're just like dreaming thinking you do let yourself take notes yes and then one day you just decide it's time to type yes yeah, nine months like i can't like i'm like okay so i know you know i can't do it until nine months after the idea and nine months after the idea actually turned out to be april 2020 which was as y'all remember quite quite a interesting time and i live yeah. in new york city so like we were very on lockdown here and during April 2020, my father also died. And oh, wow. because of the timing, like for so many people, like we weren't able to be with him while he was dying. And then we weren't able to gather after he died, mm. um, which is such a strange experience. You know, it's obviously foundational enough to lose a parent, but then to right. do it in that, that kind of isolation was so per peculiar. And so yet the ding had gone off and it was time for me to start to write. So I feel like when I started writing the book, I already had all the ideas and everything that predated, you know, the pandemic or my father or anything. But I started writing in this like very sort of heightened emotional state mm -hmm. where I had a lot of a lot of grief and a lot of fear and a lot of, you know, worry. And from the very beginning, I felt like these people mattered to me and whether they were okay mattered to me and that they that I got their story right mattered to me in this kind of like very intense <laughs> intense way that really pulled me in and I I deeply cared about them and felt like it was important for me to do them justice from the very beginning. Yeah. Wow. So how long from the time you started typing till you had like a rough draft that you were ready to let somebody read? Um, well, I have two writer friends who read sort of along the way for me, okay. read each other's first pages basically. So they read along the way. But it took about a year, a little over a year, till I had a draft, um, which is for me lightning fast. Okay. Like, like okay. I said, it usually, like Dear Edward took me eight years as well. Um, so I wrote Hello Beautiful in just about two years, which um, partly because of the pandemic and because of the emo emotional state in which I was writing it, and I just, it just felt so important to me, and I loved doing it. I didn't want to do anything else. Like it was, oh, I thought about it all the time. Did you start from the beginning and work your way through the end? Yeah, actually, what happens to Sylvie, like actually the scene, presuming you've all read it, um, the scene where she tells William that she's sick in their kitchen, that was the prologue of the book when I started. Okay. Um, and then we decided later on to move it into the flow of happening. But other than that, yeah, I read it from the beginning to the end. So um, you talked, you talked about losing your father. I feel like grief and mental health is a, a strong theme in both Dear Edward and Hello Beautiful. Is there some other reason? Is there something that compels you to sort of make that a part of, of the stories that you write? Yeah, I, I think people think that I must have suffered some absolutely catastrophic loss, and I haven't. I mean, um, I think that it's just this part of being a human being and I it's as beautiful and important and common as every other you know storyline and feeling and emotion that we have so um and also I, there's something where I want to write about love and the flip side of love is grief mm -hmm. because we, we you know we risk our hearts you know with our children with our romantic partners with our friends um and there's consequences to that and that's also love so I, it's not something that I, you know, want to shy away from exploring. I feel like it's important to explore it. And it's as, as meaningful in our lives as all the good things that happen to us. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, obviously I love fiction and um, I think that stories help us work through, work through our pain and mm -hmm. our lives. And I think a lot of times, a story of somebody experiencing, and this is more um, uh, Dear Edward, but like this horrific grief, it kind of gives you perspective on like what you 
would what I would deal with in my everyday life. And so I love that about fiction that it in and so I felt like in Hello Beautiful, you're watching these sisters and and their, their parents and their spouses, they're you're watching them like work out their family dynamics. And sometimes I feel like it's so helpful to watch someone else and be like, Oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know? And, but then somewhere like subconsciously, I feel like it helps me in the decisions that I'm making in the relationships that I have with people. And so I really loved, I really love that. Did you have a lot of sisters? I have a brother and a sister, but my best friend growing up um, who I slept at her house like half of the time, her mother has six sisters okay. and they, they used to come in and out of the house all time, all the time. And they had slightly different versions of the same face <laughs> and they seemed more themselves when they were together in a room than they did separately. And they fascinated me. Like I used to watch them like they were a television set and it was them really that I wanted to explore what that kind of like magical interwoven root system you know sometimes like really rarely and magically is in a in a group of siblings um so i was thinking of them when i started writing the padavano sisters but i think you did such a great job of making what the sisters had magical but also very complicated mm. and, and watching them sort of like navigate their closeness and yet their individuality and the decisions that they made. And it was just, um, it was just so wonderful to read and to just, I don't know, like feel like you were there watching these people like a, like, like you were the neighborhood kid and you were like coming in and kind of watching these people's lives play out. Um, so we got to talk about Little Women. Um, sure. At what point did, did you know that that there were a lot of references to Little Women. Did you set out to write sort of about Little Women? No, I think during that nine month period of like thinking and planning, it should have occurred to me <laughs> that I was writing about four sisters. And obviously I loved Little Women as a child. It's like one of the books that I think, I think that the books that you read in elementary school, if you're a reader, like a real reader, it's like you're empty at that point. You're making yourself as a person, you're so little and it's like the books that I read then, I feel like they are like the building blocks of my personality. Huh. You know, they, I loved, I loved them so much and they felt so true. And they like, they sit inside of me in a way that, no, you know, books that I read now and love, like they have to cycle out because there's no more room. Yeah. Um, so Little Women is in there, but it wasn't until like, I was like 60 pages into writing it and the sisters started arguing with each other over which March sister they were. And I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Like, like I didn't grow up, you know, thinking I was Joe, you know, like virtually every, <laughs> every other girl. Um, and I was like, oh yes, of course. Like Lori's on the outside for the March girls looking into their living room and wanting to be in there. And William is on the outside of this living room. And once I saw it, then I, I could see how it related to the story that I was telling too. And it was very pleasing for me, <laughs> but also it was lovely to write it as a kind of homage to a book that I love. Yeah, it was really well done. You know, one of the books that we read earlier this year was Demon Copperhead. Oh, I love that and, book. Um, oh my oh gosh, my like God. Amazing, amazing, right? Amazing, oh my God. And so, but that is not, like Demon Copperhead is way more on the nose I think, yeah. well, not that I've read David Copperfield, but based on what Barbara King Solver told yeah. me, <laughs> it's, I did watch a show, <laughs> but I was not willing sure. to give that sure. much of my time. But um, it was way more on the nose of the story, right? It was like a retelling. Yeah. And so when I picked up Hello Beautiful, and at some point, like something I had read had sort of clued me in, I was expecting more like Demon Copperhead of yeah. like, a retelling of the story. And so it was very, it was a delightful surprise to, to go, oh, okay. So like you say, so four sisters and the boy that comes, comes kind of into their family, but not, but like, I love the word homage because that, that really is what it is. It's like a nod to it yeah. of like a great story that we all love, mm -hmm. but yet, you know, maybe how it, it might have played out if it had been written uh, in a in a modern day yeah. time, yeah. Um, so it it is really cool, and I think it's I think 
um, this book is such a, a amazing um, example of how your subconscious sort of like can work for you when you're doing something creative. I definitely uh, admire it. I can't say that I have ever felt <laughs> like I've been in touch with my super creative side, but I enjoy other people who are. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you're saying like reading is important. It's like you see your humanness in the story, in the people and in the stories and in the situations, which allows you to like feel weirdly connected to the universe and each other and to our humanness. And, you know, you can feel lit up and plugged in by reading fiction, um, you know, in a way that really is you know, beautiful and enriching for us. I'm not saying that about my book. I'm saying that in general about, about. Reading. Yes. Well, and I'll say that about, about your books, um, because it just, it really did accomplish that for mm -hmm. me and for so many others. Um, okay. So at any point during the writing, so you do your nine months, you know, that, um, Sylvie's going to die and, uh, you got your, your, your four sisters and like, was there anything that happened as you were writing that surprised you because some authors that we talk to like Ann Paget, for instance mm. she outlines out like every single thing she's like my characters do not tell me anything I know. and so <laughs> it's so fascinating to get know, to talk to people so how was that how is your process and did they did your characters surprise you at any point yeah, I, I mean, Ann Patch is one of my favorite writers, and I went to see her when she was in New York talking about Tom Lake a couple weeks ago. And um, I, do, I can't do what she does. Like, I can't write it in my head. Um, I am much more discovering it on the page kind of person, and I really need that, like, nine months of not letting myself do that to figure things out, it, like, to kind of get close to where Ann Patch it gets, but, like, I get, like, 40% there. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot, of, a lot of surprises for me, and that's part of why I love yeah. writing. Um, you know, it's like you set up, you know, 132 different things in the beginning of the book, and then you don't know how they're going to play out towards the end. And one example that I would say of what's definitely surprised me was I knew Cecilia was a painter, one of the sisters. And I knew obviously that Pilsen in real life is covered with murals and in the book, it also is. And so when she became a mural paper painter, I was like, oh, that makes sense. Um, and then I knew that William had lost his sister before he was basically when he was a newborn. And I knew he had the picture in his closet when after his parents died of his sister, when he gave the picture to Cecilia to paint onto a wall, I had no, I was like, Oh my goodness. Like these two, I'd never thought that these two things would touch yeah. that William's sister who is gone would touch Cecilia's painting much less that he she would paint her on a wall with his daughter mm -hmm. um that's probably I saw people writing the nice things about like what their favorite scene is in the book and my probably my favorite scene is William sitting on a bench looking at that mural part, partly because I didn't know we were going to get there and that was like I felt so happy for him <laughs> and also like I was like, oh, this is amazing that these threads that I had came together in this way that I find really satisfying and beautiful. Um, like what a joy as as a creator, like as a writer, I'm so lucky. And if I was like Ann Patchett and I had it all in my head, I guess I get that joy earlier. Oh. I, just, I, just, <laughs> I, just, I just don't work that way. That's amazing. When you, so you're writing and you type? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're writing and all of a sudden this all this comes together do you keep typing or do you like run and tell somebody no i i keep typing because i'm afraid i'm gonna lose it you know like i'm like oh i'm just figuring it out it actually started with uh it a little earlier when alice is at college and it turns out she's collecting all these right copies of her aunt's art and then her mother shows up and she says to her mother do you know we're in this wall and I was like oh my god you're in the like I had no idea. and then I was like oh my god Alice is on one of Cecilia's paintings and then like it just started opening up at that point and I'm like oh it's it's going somewhere mm -hmm. that I didn't know we were going um and I yeah I try not to stop writing but then and I don't know who to tell. Like my husband actually doesn't know what my book is about until it's done. And then he reads it and he's very helpful. So I don't actually want to give away things to him along the way. Um, I think I told my two 
writer friends because I was like, what a joy. <laughs> like I just had the best afternoon ever. <laughs> <laughs> that that seems like it would be such a rewarding uh, experience. Um, okay. Is, yeah. Can we talk about Rose for a minute? Because Rose, like when I was talking about her earlier, a lot of people were disagreeing with me about the scene about Rose at the end. Um, we're like, I will say I was really mad at her. Um, especially like, you know, she picks up and she leaves and she goes to Florida and it's like, you know what? She's fine. Like she's not obligated to stay and like help continue to raise her daughters. Right. But then yeah, like, they're grown. Right. They're grown women. But then mm -hmm. kind of the way that she sort of like has something with each of them, you're kind of like, you're pretty mad at her, but it felt so real to me. Like I could just imagine, I mean, I don't have, I, I have a wonderful mother. My mom's watching. Like I don't, I'm mm -hmm. very involved. She's a great grandmother. Um, I don't really have a woman like that in my life, but I could just imagine a woman like that and she was unhappy and she was always unhappy and always unsatisfied with mm -hmm. her life so like what what made you write her like that was there any part of you that wanted to soften her at any moment during the story she would not allow for softening like she mm -hmm. just she like sort of blasted into the story and i think the thing with rose is that she had julia very young like she got pregnant before she was married you know after high school so she started having children really young she ended up marrying charlie because she got pregnant basically he's very disappointing to her because he doesn't you know provides financial stability in the way that you know she right. would certainly like and deserves and um and then she comes to rest all of her hopes and all of her aspirations on her four daughters and they have to do well for her life to mean anything Right. So when they veer off for what she sees as successful lives for them, it just it's like takes her apart because she had nothing else and she built everything in herself on that. And then when her husband dies, it is the first time in her life where she can act selfishly and also where she can sort of be free. Mm -hmm. Like she's been taking care of people forever. She's actually not that old. She's probably about 52. Mm -hmm. And I think she makes a bid for freedom and her children are grown. Her husband is dead. And this is the first chance in her life she's had for that. So I, I felt like I understood it. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's lovely of Cecilia that she takes her back the way she, she does. I mean, I think I, Cecilia is a very impressive person. Yeah. One of the comments earlier was that somebody felt like Cecilia was the kind of like the secret glue mm -hmm. of the, of the family. And I love, like, I thought Rose's relationship with Alice was, um, was also realistic. And like, mm -hmm. she was trying to have a relationship with her granddaughter, but also trying to sort of honor the decisions that Julia had made. And, and, you know, and then she ends up having these conversations. I just thought that she was just, there were so many parts of the book that were like that, but just very um realistic and people that you could imagine you know running into or being neighbors with and um just such a wonderful wonderful story and um i'm just I was so delighted i was sad when it was over i was sad that um cecilia died i i mean like i've just felt so many emotions you know and um just like that's everything that you want in a book so mm -hmm. um Thank you so much. I have to ask you a, some, a different question. I'd love to ask um, our authors, um, tell me more about who you like to read. Um, like, is there an author that um, you're like, oh, I've read all of their books? I've read all of Ann Patchett's books. <laughs> um, I think I've read all of Lauren Groff's books. I haven't read her newest one yet, but um, she's one of my favorite writers. I just recently read an a book that came out like 10 years ago that I'm sure uh, many of people on here have read because it was huge at the time. A Little Life by Hanya. Oh, yeah. Hanya. I haven't read that one. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> it almost killed me. I mean, you talk about like books that make you feel deeply. I mean, it's like, I don't know, 600 pages or something. And I, it's one of those books where I just lived inside it for the very pretty short duration of reading it. And it was so deeply emotional people being kind to each other and this 
four young men that are friends and oh my god like, like it's like the seeing your humanity but also like what a gift as a reader when a book like swallows you up like that and you feel like it is a real world and these are real people and they really matter to you and they really matter um i read widely i mean emily emily st john mandel is one of my favorite writers i think she's like extraordinary um who else? I read a lot of, I just read The Candy House by Jennifer Egan, which is like her most recent novel. Um, I think The Covenant of Water was wonderful. You were talking about Cutting for Stone. Uh -huh. I also really enjoyed that. Uh -huh. um, I'm looking forward to reading the new Jasmine Ward book. I am um, too. I, yeah. I, did that, I think it came out like this today. today. Is today Tuesday? Yeah, it came out today. And Oprah chose it today as her new book. I, book that's how I saw it. And I've been seeing like, you know, all the people who get early release copies and, mm. and write about them. I've been seeing so many people really love that book. And I really enjoyed her. I think I've read, I've read at least one, maybe two of her books. The one that took place um, with Hurricane Katrina. Um, oh yeah. Yes. That's I read Salvage the Bones, Salvage which is not that. I think it was the other one. Um, I think I read it when it came out, but I don't think that was Hurricane Katrina. But I mean, she's an amazing writer. Amazing. Yeah. So I am. I am also. That's like high on my. Yeah. Um, me. Me too. Books to read. Um, so okay, I was going to ask you something else when you said salvage the bones. Do you? Um, do you? So you you teach about fiction too, right? Yeah. Like sometimes I do it like erratically. <laughs> when you do that, do you use other books as like, do they, is it like a creative writing class or is it like, do you read other people's books and what books would you use to teach? Uh, I, well, generally I teach like a fiction workshop. So I'm reading the student's work. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then like, and actually in December, I'm teaching an online class for one story, which is a literary magazine. Um, and that is actually about how to craft your writing life. Like how to, how to like, I hate the word optimize, but how to like, folk, how to make sure that your life serves your work and that you ah. can show up to write and be so that the channels are open and that you can write the book that you're meant to write or the story that you're meant to write. So I sort of, I do it in both of those. I haven't taught like a literature class where I teach um, fiction itself, though I have taken ah. many, <laughs> many such ah. classes. Would you say Little Women is like your all time favorite? My all-time favorite book? Yeah. Oh, God. I can't, I can't do that. That's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> it's truly impossible. Uh, it's one of the books that, like, sits and lives inside of me. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, I can't do favorite. Like, because then, then I have to go through, like, my whole life and be like, at this period, this was my favorite book. At this period, this was my favorite. I mean, Little Women probably wins elementary school. Um, but also then there's, like, um, the Betsy. Tacy books and Trixie Belden, who's a detective, and I read so many books when I was in elementary school. Um, I read all, <laughs> I read all the time, obviously, and I listen to books all the time. Is there a um, book that you have read more than once, or many, oh, many times? Yeah, I have a friend who reads Jane Eyre every year, and I have read Jane Eyre a couple times actually, but I don't tend to. I'm trying to think. I don't tend to reread books. Um, I like love them and put them on my shelves and then like I'll look at them and I'll turn to a page and be like, oh my God, I love this scene and um, I'll dip in and out of it, but I don't tend to reread that much. Do you? Um, I have a handful of books that I've read multiple times. A lot of them are books that I've read to my kids. Mm, oh, sure. So not like, like, um, I don't know. I have little traditions. Like I always read, um, their first novel that I read to them was Charlotte's web. So I've read that mm. three times. I always read, uh, Ramona, the brave, the year that they were the summer they were going into kindergarten. I just had little like milestone books like that. Yeah. Um, so I think I've read, um, I've read gone with the wind a couple of times. Yeah. Um, I, I, that was a book that I read when I was like 13. And mm. so then I read it again as an adult. Um, I, I'm like you, I don't reread a lot, but um, especially my daughter's getting older. And so I will, like I'm reading um, 
The Nightingale with her by Kristen Hanna. Oh yeah, I'm I haven't reading. read that yet. I should read that, shouldn't I? Oh man, that's one of my favorites. Yeah. That's probably in my in my top ten at least, maybe top five. I just oh, wow. yeah. World, a for a World War Two novel, mm -hmm. it's just it's wonderful. It's about two sisters. Yeah. So it's like heroin kind of vibe. And so I, I've read, th there are a few books that I will wait like 10 years and then read again, just because I want to experience it again. But yeah. not, not too many. But I also have memories. I think it's interesting when you talk about, I wonder how many people that would consider themselves readers as an adult found some type of, of, of connection to reading as a child. Um, Cause I have a lot of memories of reading as a child and as a teenager. And I had a bunch of uh, like a series of books, they weren't even like, they're not even like well-known books. They were like Christian fiction that my mom had picked up by an author named Lori Wick. And I would read, I remember like pulling it out and rereading certain scenes or like reading the book and then like skimming parts of it and then like loving like the scene where they fall in love or whatever. Um, so I, I think I did that of, when I was young. Too. Yeah, like Anne of the Anne of Green Gables books and uh, Emily of New Moon, which was also by her. Like those books, I think I ingested numerous times and I skimmed and read the parts that I loved the most. Mm -hmm. That's what's so great about books. Thank you for for talking to me about books. Yeah. Thank you for writing such a lovely, two truly wonderful stories. And um, do you have anything you're working on now? I'm working on a novel now, yeah. The nine-month timer went off in June, so I'm about, whatever that is, five months into it. Okay. Um, Do you think I, it's going to take you eight years or two years? I think <laughs> hopefully closer to two years. I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I'm working at a pretty good clip, um, and I'm really enjoying it, so we'll see. That's wonderful. Well, I um, just wish you just blessings on your writing, and I'm just so appreciative of people like you who are putting great stories out in the world so thank you and thank you for coming on and talking with me oh thank you for talking with me and thank you for choosing hello beautiful for all your lovely fans you're welcome we loved it and i'm going to tell everybody to go back and read dear edward if they haven't so uh -oh. thank, thank you. you well guys i hope that you enjoyed that conversation with Anne and that you enjoyed this book hello beautiful as much as i did it was just such a gorgeous story and um and I just thoroughly enjoyed every second of it and every second of our conversation together and our conversation with Anne. So if you would like more content like this, make sure that you uh, like, subscribe, leave me a comment, let me know if there's a book that you would recommend for our book club. And if you wanna join the book club, go to hollyfurtick.com and um, just all you have to do is put in your email and we will let you know what we're reading and when you're meeting so that you can join us live. And um, again, I hope you enjoyed that conversation and I'll see you back here next time.